Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Edward Hoffer, the speaker for today's webinar. I will be presenting material for about 40 minutes, and we will then have a 10-minute Q&A session. Please jot down any questions or comments that you have. Uh, we've got quite a bit of material to cover, so I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, so let's get started with today's uh, topic hyperlipidemia, statins, and beyond. And away we go. Is it, it is visible now? Good. Yes, doctor, you can start the webinar. All right, thank you. The obligatory uh, commercial disclosures, I have none. I have never taken a penny from uh, Big Pharma and have no plans to do so. The whole issue of uh, cholesterol and coronary disease is actually remarkably new. The uh, connection was only established uh, from late in the 50s through the mid 60s, a seminal paper from the Framingham Art Study in about 1964 established that indeed high cholesterol was a major risk factor for coronary events. Uh, unfortunately, it, in that period of time, attempts to reduce heart attack by lowering cholesterol were not terribly successful. Major reason being that the medicines available at that point were poorly tolerated and not terribly effective. I'm not sure if many in the audience are, still remember niacin or cholestyramine, but uh, Many of my patients after an initial attempt would say, thank you, doc, but I'd rather risk a heart attack than take this for uh, the rest of my life. The major reason why diet alone is almost never successful is that the cholesterol manufactured in the liver is the major determinant of circulating cholesterol, much more important than dietary cholesterol. I'm not saying that low cholesterol diets aren't to be advised, just warning that they are rarely terribly effective. Uh, liver cholesterol synthesis in turn is mediated by a multi-step process that we'll show a little later, but the uh, enzyme HMG-CoA reductase is a key step in the manufacture of cholesterol in the liver. And so logically blocking HMG-CoA reductase will suppress liver cholesterol synthesis and in turn uh, lower cholesterol. The initial work on HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors was begun by Sanyo, a major pharmaceutical firm in Japan. Uh, in the 1970s, but uh, they never pursued it terribly actively because of animal toxicity that showed up early. Uh, in this country, uh, some investigators working in the Merck Research Lab discovered lovastatin, uh, somewhat analogous to Fleming's discovery of penicillin. They found it in a fermentation broth of aspergillus. They did uh, human trials in healthy volunteers beginning about 1980, but after uh, Sanyo's product, Compactin, was withdrawn due to toxicity in animals, Merck suspended trials uh, on a compassionate use basis. Small-scale trials of lovastatin were begun about 1982 in patients who had severe hyperlipidemia, familial hyperlipidemia, and they, these very small trials showed that uh, the product worked and that in fact in humans it had almost no side effects. Clinical trials expanded and showed the same thing. Excellent tolerability, excellent cholesterol lowering effects. And the first uh, statin was approved for clinical use in this country in 1987. At the top recommended dose of 80 milligrams a day, lovastatin reduced LDL cholesterol by 40%, dramatically better than any of the old, less effective and less well-tolerated drugs. And lovastatin became a smash commercial hit for Merck, reaching annual sales of over a billion dollars. 
And of course that opened the floodgates to a number of uh, Me Too drugs. And there are now at least seven uh, available for sale in this country and possibly eight of you uh, look worldwide. Okay, lowering cholesterol is great, but as I have said repeatedly, cholesterol is not arsenic. You don't die of cholesterol, you die of coronary disease, which in turn is mediated by cholesterol. So you've got to show that not only does the drug lower cholesterol, but that it prevents coronary disease and prevents deaths. And the landmark trial in this was the 4S study done in Scandinavia. They took over 4,000 patients who were by definition high risk. They had known coronary disease. These were patients who'd suffered a myocardial infarct or had ongoing angina. All of them were given the standard low fat diet of the day, randomized to either simvastatin or placebo and followed up for five and a half years. Uh, in the doses used, uh, simvastatin reduced LDL cholesterol by 35% compared with the placebo group. And there was a quite statistically and clinically significant drop in death in the death rate. It was reduced from 12% in the placebo group to 8% in the simvastatin group for a relative risk ratio of 0.7. The Decrease in coronary deaths was even more dramatic, and there was a reduction in the need for coronary bypass surgery. So a clear and absolute benefit in this, in this group. Dropping the bar a little bit, we look at the West of Scotland trial. It was reported out about a year later. Uh, they looked at 6,500 men who had hyperlipidemia with a mean cholesterol of 272 but no known coronary disease, a middle-aged entry, and followed for almost five years on either pravastatin or placebo. And again, coronary events, non-fatal MI were reduced 31%. All deaths were reduced by 22%. And the absolute reduction, as you can see, was not as dramatic as in the 4S trial, uh, but almost a percent less. Dropping the bar even lower, the AFCAP study enlisted active duty air uh, force members, and this was the first trial to include women, though again, the majority were men. These were healthy adults with what was felt to be at the time a normal cholesterol uh, for the US in the 1990s, mean was 221. And they were treated with lovastatin. It was started at 20, could be increased to 40. And this again was compared with placebo, follow up about five years. And the outcome, which has become fairly standard, the abbreviation is MACE, major adverse coronary events. Uh, and they included fatal or non-fatal MI, hospitalization for unstable angina or a sudden cardiac death. And the primary endpoint was again, was reduced in a similar manner, 37%. Obviously, this was a lower risk group and the absolute uh, lowering was, was smaller. And I would like to call your attention to the difference between absolute and relative benefits. Uh, pharmaceutical companies love to talk about the relative benefits of their product compared to others, because these are always more impressive numbers. You know, if you say that something is reduced 35, 40%, boy, that's really impressive. But I caution you, especially if you're dealing with lower risk patients, to think in terms of absolute benefits. So let's compare the three trials in three different risk groups. 4S trial, known coronary disease, clearly very high, uh, high risk group. And the uh, events were reduced from 28% to 19.4%. So an absolute dropping of, of 8%, 8 per 100 people treated. Uh, West of Scotland trial, a moderate risk group, and the, again, a similar relative risk, but the absolute risk reduction was a little over 2%. Similarly, AFCAPS trial, 
a low risk group. And again, a lowering of similar percentage wise, but um, the absolute difference was smaller. Uh, even more contrast when you look at deaths. And I, when looking at any study of any product, the first number I like to look at is deaths. Most everything else is potentially problematic. If you look, uh, read the fine print, you'll see that in many cases, a committee will adjudicate whether somebody had a heart attack. And uh, at least uh, to my way of thinking, you don't need a committee to decide if somebody's alive or dead. So start with start with deaths. Those are those are hard, about as hard a number as you can get. High risk group, 12 to 8 percent. So for every 100 people you treat, you are keeping four additional people alive. Uh, quite important to most patients. When you get to a less uh, high risk group, you're getting about a percent reduction in deaths. And when you get down to the low risk groups, you're getting 0.4 absolute reduction. So very similar uh, relative reduction, but much lower absolute reduction. Uh, a recent meta-analysis looked at all the statin trials and they came up with uh, not a surprising conclusion, which is major cardiovascular events were reduced similarly at all risk levels. And in fact, the lower risk group, you might've had a larger relative risk reduction. But when you're dealing with the patient in front of you and you're dealing with somebody who is borderline is the indication, remember to think absolute. You know, are you, how much are you actually benefiting this patient by prescribing a drug? All right, statins are, to my mind, one of the most successful group of drugs uh, ever devised, perhaps second to antibiotics, but they do have the downside and the downside is side effects. And this, if not a concern to you, I can assure you is a concern to your patients. And if you go on social media, you'll discover enormous amounts of discussion about real and putative side effects of, uh, of the statins. First concern to come to public attention was cognitive impairment, dementia. And in fact, in 2012, the FDA put a black box warning on all of the statins. And at the time that did lead to decreased uh, prescribing. Uh, the following year, uh, an examination of their uh, uh, AIRS, the adverse event reporting system claimed that this should not apply to hydrophilic statins like pravastatin, but only to the lipophilic statins. The best study that I'm aware of that looked at this was a very large review and meta-analysis that was uh, printed uh, 2021. And they looked at 24 studies with almost a million and a half enrollees. And they found that there was absolutely no association of statin use and cognitive impairment. And I think that this is something that you can uh, count on as being uh, established and reassure your patients that this does not seem to be a real phenomenon. The reason that Sanyo never marketed compactin because was because of fairly significant liver toxicity in some of the early animal studies. And because of that, the FDA mandated initially that all the statins have a package insert recommending that liver function tests be monitored periodically. Uh, this proved to be so rare that in fact, this was removed from the package insert in 2012. It is real but it's infrequent. Somewhere on the order of 1% of statin users will have modest elevations of uh, liver enzymes. And if you continue the statin, about 70% of these tests will return to normal within two to three months. And they do not uh, require anything more than monitoring. Serious liver damage does occur. Uh, I've been fortunate never to have had it occur in my personal practice, but I'm aware of at least one patient who did have uh, very severe liver uh, damage. 
It is estimated to occur in roughly 19 per 100,000 users and can have, have either a hepatocellular or an obstructive pattern on the, and this does require permanent cessation and not uh, using any other statins. Acute liver failure has been estimated to occur in about one in a million. Um, take home from this is don't worry about the liver, don't check routinely, but if anybody has any symptoms at all, that's the time to, uh, to check their liver function. Diabetes is a more recent concern and diabetes is real and there's a pharmacologic uh, physiologic explanation. Statins do decrease insulin secretion by beta cells. They increase peripheral insulin resistance and there is a larger relative but small absolute increase in the new diagnosis of diabetes in patients put on statin. This was looked at specifically in the Jupiter trial of resuvastatin. There was a 24% relative increase in new diagnoses of diabetes. The absolute increase was a more modest 0.6% of users. Why do people with diabetes die? The vast majority of them die from cardiovascular conditions. And most studies have shown that in fact, the benefit from lipid lowering vastly exceeded any concern about uh, increased uh, diabetes. So again, I think something that uh, needs to be kept in mind, but should not dissuade you from, uh, from prescribing the drugs. The elephant in the room, muscle. Uh, rhabdomyolysis does occur. It's exceedingly rare, less than one in 100,000 per year but is obviously very serious, can lead to acute tubular necrosis. Um, much uh, still very uncommon. There is an immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy that occurs in estimated two to three per 100,000 users. And you'll get CK elevations, you'll get abnormal EMGs. And this is a cross uh, immunity between the statins and muscle. There is a direct toxic myopathy of from statins with uh, where the CK is markedly elevated and you get proximal muscle weakness. This is so rare that there are no good estimates of the, uh, of the actual incidents. It's been isolated case reports. So all these things are real, they are rare. What is not rare is myalgia. And some nine to 10% of patients who are begun on a statin do complain of muscle aches. Um, this has been looked at six ways to Sunday, and it is in the majority of cases, a nocebo effect. Crossover trials have shown that patients had a similar degree of complaints of myalgia, whether they were taking a statin or a placebo. Um, I can testify to this personally. When I finally went on a statin, uh, I began to get achy, was sure it was a statin until I realized that it, I had also decided to up my weights at the gym by 25%. And in fact, that was why my muscles were achy. When I backed down on the weights and continued my statin, the muscle aches went away. It is a problem that clinicians have to deal with and is probably the number one reason why your patients may top, stop taking their statin. How do you handle it? If a patient complains of muscle aches, first thing you do is measure the CK. And if that is normal, you can reassure the patient that uh, this is nothing serious. And if they still want you to do something, step one, lower the dose. If you've started them on 10 of atorvastatin, cut it to five. If they still complain of muscle aching, I would switch to a different statin and again, using you know, pharmacologic thinking, try switching them from one of the more commonly used statins to pravastatin, which is water soluble. And you can honestly tell them this is you know, less likely to do it. If they're still complaining of muscle aches, add over-the-counter CoQ10, which has some very soft data behind it saying that it, it's helpful. 
And if it persists, then you simply have to give up and use an alternative drug. Uh, but uh, again, if your patient says they hurt, they hurt and you can't talk them out of that. How large is statin? Uh, there are two approaches to alternative protocols, either treat to target or uh, use a maximal uh, available dose. Uh, one study looked at uh, two different doses of atorvastatin and uh, they felt that you know, an arbitrary dose of uh, 80 milligrams of atorvastatin was clinically more beneficial. Um, that was less clear given the comparator, which was a lower dose simvastatin. Study that was just reported out a little over a month ago, looked at uh, 4,400 patients with coronary disease, and they were given either a high dose of statin arbitrary or had the statin titrated to get their LDL below 70. And uh, there's no significant difference. There was a trend towards fewer events in the titrated group, but uh, uh, the bottom line is it was not inferior to using an arbitrary large dose. And the pharmacology of most statins is unusual in that the dose response curve is pretty flat, that if you, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck out of a, your starting dose, and every time you double the dose, you get less and less return in terms of lower cholesterols. So start on the low side, measure and go up if you need to. Some of you may be asking yourselves at this point, why is this guy talking about statins? I know everything there is to know about statins. I've used them forever. Um, and the reason I am starting off with statins and we'll, we will end up finishing with them is the data that I'm showing you right now. Data from the National Health Study looks at a representative sample of people all across America, studies a whole variety of things. And they looked at uh, 3,400 middle-aged people who had LDLs over 190. And I think everybody in this country, everybody on this webinar would agree that an LDL over 190 is really bad and should be treated, okay? but only a quarter of these patients were on any drugs to lower their cholesterol. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, blacks and Hispanics were even less well treated than whites, but uh, even among uh, Caucasian patients, a mere 28% were prescribed statins with LDLs that were dramatically elevated. Uh, if you look at the, how at their risk group, you know, factor in things like smoking and family history and blood pressure, they were stratified into three different risk groups. And even among the highest risk group, only 35% of these people were being treated. So, you know, uh, you may think that uh, this is an answered question, but I can assure you, if you look across the country, that these drugs are vastly underused at this point. 